Welcome back, colleagues. I would like you to ask to take your seats so we can start with the next item on the agenda, and that is the draft report of the Subcommittee on Future Security and Defense Capabilities called the Space Domain and Allied Defense by Madeleine Moon. But because Madeleine Moon could not be here with us today, our long-standing colleague, Gilbert Lebris, has kindly agreed to step in and present this report, this draft report, to you. Gilbert, thank you for that. The floor is yours. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Comme vous venez de le dire et comme on a pu le constater, Madeleine Moon n'a pas pu se présenter ici à Tbilisi en raison d'élections au Royaume-Uni. Ce n'est pas le seul pays où il y a des élections, mais il y en a là-bas aussi. Elle m'a donc demandé de la suppléer pour présenter le rapport de la sous-commission sur l'avenir de la sécurité et des capacités de défense à sa place. Ce rapport, intitulé « Domaine spatial » et défense alliée porte sur un sujet essentiel pour notre sous-commission. La course à l'espace est aujourd'hui une réalité. Le rythme de développement et de la diffusion des technologies fait que la croissance de l'exploitation du domaine spatial n'a jamais été aussi rapide. Ainsi, le recours aux équipements spatiaux s'est accru de manière spectaculaire et aussi bien au niveau de nos États et de nos armées que parmi les entités civiles et commerciales. Les avantages du recours à l'espace sont évidents et multiples. Les équipements concernés fournissent des données utilisables pour la géolocalisation et la navigation et sont le relais de données exploitables à grande échelle par les systèmes de communication dans les domaines les plus divers, et notamment pour ce qui concerne les transactions financières, le suivi des avions civils et le suivi des navires. Entre parenthèses, nous avons eu l'occasion récemment en Norvège, dans le Svalbard, de voir une application concrète de ce genre de choses, et je dois dire que c'est particulièrement spectaculaire. Comme le souligne également très bien le rapport, les infrastructures spatiales joue un rôle croissant dans le domaine militaire. Qu'il s'agisse de la manœuvre des forces, qu'il s'agisse du renseignement, de l'étude et de l'analyse du terrain, ou encore du domaine des frappes de précision. Par conséquent, tout comme elles ont besoin de liberté de manœuvre dans les domaines terrestres, maritimes et aériens, dans leurs territoires respectifs, les forces de l'OTAN doivent être à l'abri des interférences pour les moyens déployés dans l'espace. L'interaction d'acteurs militaires et civils toujours plus nombreux dans un espace peu réglementé et en constante ébullition technologique est ainsi une problématique puisque le domaine spatial devient de plus en plus encombré, disputé, et concurrentielle. Or, l'espace est un cadre assez peu réglementé. Le traité de 1967 sur les principes régissant les activités des États en matière d'exploration et d'utilisation de l'espace extra-atmosphérique, y compris la Lune et les autres corps célestes, a été conclu à une période et à une époque où il n'y avait que deux puissances spatiales en compétition, les États-Unis et l'Union soviétique. Il a été complété par plusieurs textes, conventions et déclarations des Nations unies que l'espace qui font que l'espace est ce qu'on appelle une res nullius, libre d'accès, mais au sein duquel le déploiement d'armes nucléaires et d'armes de destruction massive, massive est interdit. Sans code de conduite, régissant avec plus de précision l'utilisation de l'espace, la croissance du nombre d'acteurs 
et porteuse de risques. C'est cette tension entre les opportunités et les défis au sein du domaine spatial que ce rapport cherche à mettre en évidence. La réglementation de l'espace et de son exploitation se heurte à un écueil de taille. La distinction de plus en plus problématique entre moyens spatiaux à vocation civile et systèmes à caractère militaire. En effet, près de 40% des véhicules spatiaux en orbite aujourd'hui sont des satellites militaires. Et on peut dire que la quasi-totalité des satellites fournissent des services à double usage. En raison de sa militarisation, l'utilisation du domaine spatial revêt des enjeux de nature différente. Politique, tout d'abord, afin de garantir une utilisation pacifique de l'espace, économique et scientifique, en raison des applications spatiales dans de nombreux domaines, et de sûreté, avec comme sujet central la menace que constitue la prolifération des débris spatiaux. Les débris spatiaux sont une menace de premier ordre, pesant sur les moyens déployés dans l'espace. Les restes des collisions passées et les épaves des satellites obsolètes, issus d'une longue histoire de réglementation défaillante, des activités spatiales se sont accumulées. Les débris spatiaux d'origine sur orbite dépassent le nombre de 500 000. Je répète, le nombre de 500 000. Cette multiplication des débris spatiaux accentue le risque des dommages pesant sur les infrastructures critiques. Ces débris en orbite représentent l'un des principaux risques d'échec des missions spatiales. Dans l'ensemble, l'environnement spatial est donc le vecteur de nouvelles capacités indispensables au système militaire de pointe de l'Alliance. Mais la dépendance accrue envers les moyens déployés dans le domaine spatial expose chaque acteur à des risques avérés. Bien que tous les alliés dépendent d'un accès fiable et sûr aux moyens spatiaux, l'Alliance n'a toujours pas publié de stratégie ou de politique militaire pour ces opérations spatiales. C'est pourquoi les parlements des pays de l'Alliance ont un rôle clé à jouer dans la promotion d'un code de conduite pour l'espace pouvant mener à terme à la création d'un cadre juridique international précis et viable pour l'exploitation spatiale. Il est également nécessaire d'attirer l'attention sur les programmes d'élimination des débris spatiaux, sans lesquels l'accès aux trajectoires spatiales et aux fréquences d'émission risque de devenir difficile et dangereux. Au XXIe siècle, la défense et la dissuasion sont profondément tributaires de l'accès des alliés au domaine spatial et de la liberté d'accéder sans restriction aux moyens spatiaux. C'est pour cela que nous nous devons de défendre le principe de viabilité à long terme des activités spatiales, ainsi que de soutenir les, les initiatives qui s'y rapportent. Mes chers collègues, avant de vous remercier de votre attention, je veux remercier le directeur de la Commission d'avoir euh, aidé à la réalisation de ce cours exposé. Merci. Merci beaucoup, uh, Gilbert, uh, for taking over uh, from Madeleine. Uh, I've got two questions so far. First one is a question of Mike Turner, USA. Uh, thank you. I, um, I want to acknowledge the importance of, of this report, I think, which is highlighted in paragraph 53, that NATO's most advanced military systems are dependent upon space-based assets in order to execute their missions. Uh, as many of you are aware, I have chaired the Strategic Forces Subcommittee for the House, and currently I'm still a member of that committee. Um, 
and I have a number of concerns with the report and its, uh, its tone, which I've, I've raised with um, Ethan, and I believe that uh, we can work on between now and, and the fall, but I wanted to highlight a couple of those. If you look at uh, paragraph 32, it, it incorrectly states that the um, uh, military use of the um, of, of space um, seemed to take a, uh, an increase as a result of the Bush administration's desired doctrine of a space defense uh, policy. Uh, the word defense is what's important in there. There was no militarization of space by the U.S. or by the Bush administration. It, it was a statement which parallels paragraph 53 of recognizing the importance of space-based assets for, for our defense. And it was in light of a recognition of China and Russia programs that were uh, designed to both diminish impact um, and um, eliminate uh, the this, this space assets of uh, the United States and our NATO allies. So the, um, when you get to paragraph 34, it says, like, in addition, both China and Russia developed modern space warfare, warfare programs. It's, in fact, reversed. They were developing programs. We identified it as a need for an area of defense. And if you look at the last sentence of 32, there, there's also an incorrect uh, statement there. It says that, you know, the U.S. modified the SM-3 missile system to be asset ASAT capable, that, that's not true. Um, there, you, you also cite no, no source for that. Uh, I think that may be an extrapolation of the uh, Aegis um, interception of a satellite that was declining in orbit and was in fact itself space debris. In looking at um, paragraph 25 through 30, I think in that section it needs to be acknowledged that China irresponsibly um, uh, destroyed one of its own satellites. Um, creating a significant amount of debris. I do know that that is uh, referenced in paragraph 36, but I do think it should be moved forward in the, to the fact that it's not just space debris that's being irresponsibly left, it's also those that are being irresponsibly created. And if you, um, if you look at paragraph 36 and 37, we also have that, again, the contrast that needs to be addressed here. It, it indicates that, that China shot down one of its satellites creating a, um, a debris but then it says in 37 that the United States, in using our Aegis Ashore to take out a satellite that was um, actually losing orbit, uh, and it was then a responsible manner because it was low enough in orbit that all of its debris was, was destroyed, it actually seems to indicate that we did that in response to China, and that's obviously not the case. It was in response to the crisis that the uh, satellite um, presented. But then in, um, in Section 2, um, 40, you know, starting with paragraph 42, the, um, all of these non-connect means, cyber attacks, jamming, spoofing, and, and dazing, I think there needs to be recognition that these are China and Russia programs that they're actively developing, looking to destabilize space, um, and we, we certainly think that those, it should be acknowledged that these are their active programs that make it a greater concern of, of ours. And then um, as you get to um, the code of conduct, um, the United States was unwilling to go forward with the code of conduct because it did not cover existing China and Russian programs, those that were known. Um, and so it, it, is, it gives the impression that the United States was an impediment. In fact, we, we weren't an impediment. We, we were just trying to bring forward the acknowledgement of the, the threats that Russia's and China's programs currently had. So I, I look forward to working with um, the, the Defense Committee and the Subcommittee and, and Ethan on, uh, and certainly uh, Madeline, on um, ways to, um, to adjust this so it might more actively reflect that these are true risks and uh, how we might need to address them. Thank you. Thank you. Then Ming Campbell, UK. Uh, <clears throat> on, behalf, on behalf of Madeleine Moon, I'd like to thank Monsieur Le Brie for presenting this on her behalf. She is engaged in seeking re-election in the British general election. Uh, and that's the only possible reason that would keep her away. Um, as I understand it, at present, France, the United Kingdom and Italy, under memorandum of understanding, provide all military satellites for NATO. But that agreement comes to an end in uh, 2019. And in the meantime, a consortium has been created between the United Kingdom, United States, France, and Italy, with a view to responding to these requirements for the period 
2019 to 2034. It seems to me it might help NATO to make that decision a little more quickly than it's been doing up till now if there was some reference to that in the report. Um, I appreciate that uh, uh, both Mr. Nabri and myself and Mike Turner, uh, well, we've got a sort of a national interest in this since our countries are part of the consortium. But looking at this from the point of view of the general good of everyone, and in particular of NATO, the earlier this contract is entered into, the better it will be for all of us. Thank you. Then James Sensenbrenner from the United States. Not anymore. Uh, Rick Larson. Oh, sorry. Rick Larson. I apologize on behalf of Ethan and myself. <laughs> I'll pass it on to Mr. Sensenbrenner. Um, on, in Section D, uh, re regarding uh, space debris, uh, I just think you can expand a little bit more specifically in the report on ways to mitigate, uh, including uh, the ability to repair autonomously um, or remotely uh, disabled satellites, um, as well uh, the work going on in design features into satellites uh, to minimize the, um, uh, uh, the, the possibility that, that a dead satellite stays in orbit, um, that it actually, uh, once it dies, we can, uh, it, it comes down autonomously. Um, there, there, are th there are ways, I, I'm just saying you can maybe be a little more detailed than that. Another discussion going on right now in the U.S. has to do with the um, tracking and avoiding space debris, which largely falls on the U.S. Air Force. And there's discussion about whether or not to move that to a civilian agency. Um, so the, if you want to call it the governance, I don't think that's the exact right word, but for the sake of today, the governance of who tracks and avoids and communicates with satellite operators um, is, uh, is a discussion more and more we're having. Uh, in the United States in order to free up our U.S. Air Force from doing that job and, and maybe giving it to uh, one, of a, one of the civilian agencies. Um, it might be uh, maybe worth exploring some, uh, some thoughts on that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? <clears throat> Not? Okay. Julia. Oui, sans avoir la prétention de répondre comme l'aurait fait avec pertinence Madeleine Moon, je vais essayer d'apporter quelques précisions à ce qui a été dit. Bon, d'abord, euh, Michael Turner a donné des précisions historiques qui seront bien sûr certainement prises en compte pour le rapport définitif, parce qu'il y a des éléments de fait qu'il faut effectivement rappeler. Euh, je, je pense que d'une façon globale, on a tous conscience que nous sommes en pleine ruée vers l'espace. Ruée vers l'espace où des puissances installées, comme le sont les nôtres, et des puissances émergentes, mais aussi des acteurs privés, mais aussi des acteurs privés, se positionnent. Et donc je crois qu'il y a la question des débris, on l'a dit, il y a la question des retombées, on le sait, mais on ne peut pas échapper à un moment à se poser la question de règles de droit international précises dans ce domaine. Et je dois dire que nous soutenons les travaux des Nations Unies dans ce domaine, même si ce n'est pas facile. Il est évident que l'espace doit être un bien commun, comme le sont les océans, par exemple. Et donc, ça devrait être un domaine de coopération mutuelle et de respect. Alors, je sais la difficulté, parce que euh, si l'idée de ce code de conduite s'impose, il n'en demeure pas moins qu'il y a une interrogation c'est de quels moyens disposerons-nous pour promouvoir un tel instrument au niveau international et éviter que des pays récalcitants ne, ne puissent s'abstraire de leurs obligations. Quelques pays n'ont d'ailleurs pas, à ma connaissance, ratifié le traité de 1967, je pense notamment à l'Iran, qui a pourtant des capacités spatiales. Donc on est dans une vraie problématique d'application des règles dans ce domaine-là, je pense que ce n'est pas le seul domaine dans lequel le droit international, au-delà de sa validité juridique, a des difficultés à avoir des applications pratiques 
avec ce qui implique effectivement à ce moment-là des sanctions, des mises au banc de la société, etc. Ça n'est pas facile, ça ne nous empêche pas de souhaiter que l'on aille vers cette orientation. Voilà quelques remarques que je souhaitais faire euh, avec les propos qui ont été tenus et je remercie Mike Campbell d'avoir euh, signifié à quel point Madeleine Moon est effectivement d'une présence remarquable ici chaque fois qu'elle le peut et il faut vraiment un empêchement majeur auquel on lui souhaite une issue positive pour qu'elle s'abstraire ici. Thank you very much, uh, Gilles Beer, for your kind words and taking over the hard work of Madeleine Moon. Um, we will see the final report in Bucharest in the order. Thank you very much. Then we'll turn over to the last report, and that's the draft report of the Subcommittee on Transatlantic Defence and Security Cooperation, and it is on NATO-EU cooperation after Warsaw. It uh, should be presented, or uh, was intended to present by Attila Mesterhazy from Hungary, but he could also not attend, so we asked Angeline Eysink to fill in for him today, and she was willing to, happily. So, Angeline. For the last time, like Shield Beer, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Chairman, thank you very much to your friends and colleagues. Um, I'm happy to you to present the Defence Security Committee's draft report on NATO EU cooperation after Warsaw. As you may not aware, and you actually just told your reporter, Atali Mesterazi is unable to attend today's meeting due to a party congress and he sends his regrets and asks me to present his report today in his place. And uh, I'm not really sure if the last report is always the rest report at the day, but it might be. It's up to you to conclude that, but I'm convinced. I'm convinced already, so I'm asking you afterwards if you're convinced as well. Colleagues, I really have to get used to that I'm sitting here, you're looking up there. So I see all the eyes going up there while I'm sitting here. I think all of you have that. It's kind of strange, you know, because you watch up there and I, I'm looking, trying to look you in the eyes <laughs> to, to see if we still are awake at the end of the day. But thank you so much. So I can easily follow you through the other screen up here. So you know that there are two screens up here. <laughs> Colleagues. Efforts to strengthen NATO and EU cooperation have a long history with relatively little success in producing tangible results. High-level political disagreements have long been the principal hurdles to stronger strategic partnership between both organizations, as we all know and experienced. Today, however, there is a new momentum to create a real, structured and mutual beneficial cooperation between NATO and EU. This momentum is driven by the complex new security environment, which has fundamentally changed NATO's and EU's conception of European peace and stability. Russia's aggression against Ukraine in Moscow, attempts to expand its influence in the Euro-Atlantic area, have caught NATO and the EU off guard. Growing instability in the Middle East, coupled with destabilizing destabilizing in, in migration waves and terrorist attacks have exposed further deficiencies in NATO's and EU's perception of internal and external threats. Consequently, NATO and the EU must revisit their strategies for tackling current and further security challenges. The only way, dear colleagues, to achieve this goal is through closer partnership. Let me now move on and talk a little bit more about the draft report itself. First, I would like to note the report contains an annex, as you have seen, from the European Parliament with a very thoughtful contribution, which stresses the importance of strengthening the NATO-EU partnership through a wide range of means, including the development of closer relations between the European Parliament and the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. We also discussed that before, and it's good to see that there are also members of the European Parliament up here. Regarding the annex to the reporter, would very much appreciate your input about the way to incorporate the contribution from the European Parliament as it comes from a non-member state. Given the topic and the efforts by the NATO Parliamentary Assembly to also strengthen its ties with the EU Parliament, the rapporteur feels the annex should be accepted and incorporated as such into the official report. 
Please do note your opinions, colleagues, if you have any about this matter during the discussion after this presentation. And also, as you noted, the draft report looks at the history of NATO-EU cooperation. The outcomes of the Vosloo Summit and prospects for future cooperation in three principal areas. First of all, the hyper threats, secondly, cybersecurity, and third, counterterrorism. As I just mentioned, the draft report begins with a brief historical view of the NATO-EU cooperation to date. Attempt to create a political framework for NATO-EU cooperation began in 2002, a long time ago, 15 years exactly. The lead to the conclusion of the Berlin Plus agreements, arrangements, excuse me, in 2003, which strengthened NATO-EU partnership and provided a formal framework for future NATO-EU joint missions. It might not seem that long ago, and long actually is, had happened, of course, in 15 years. However, following the EU enlargement in 2004, the process of strengthening closer NATO-EU cooperation came to a halt. This was mainly due to the issues of sensitive information sharing between NATO and the EU, as well as the accession of Cyprus into the European Union. Consequently, NATO-EU cooperation within the Berlin Plus framework was suspended, as we are all aware of. Over the years, colleagues, NATO and EU replaced Berlin Plus framework with robust mechanisms of informal cooperation, which still form the backbone of the strategic partnership between our two organizations. However, informal solutions have several shortcomings, and we've been through that and experienced that. The creators include challenges coordinating of intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, efforts and intelligence exchange between NATO and the EU. The Warsaw Summit, July last year, brought new hope and urgence for the establishment of tangible measures strengthening formal cooperations between NATO and the EU. The summit produced several critical initiatives which are currently being implemented. The NATO-EU joint declaration outlines seven areas expected to be key to strengthen cooperation, including hybrid threats, maritime operations, defense industry and research, cybersecurity, exercises and capability building. This draft report views hybrid threats, cybersecurity and terrorism challenges as the main drivers of strengthening our cooperation NATO and EU. And both organizations, as you know, have already taken a series of steps to enhance partnership in close areas. In recent months, NATO and EU officials have agreed on several substantive measures to counter and respond to hybrid threats. This includes coordination and of crisis response mechanisms and activities to provide coherent and capable responses to hybrid threats. Discussions between NATO and EU have already produced some tangible results, luckily. And as we all know, on the 11th of April 2017, for instance, NATO and EU welcomed the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding for the establishment of a Center of Excellence for Countering Hybrid Threats in Helsinki. The center is expecting to begin its operations later this year. And as you know, it has been discussed by the President of the United States as well, and it has been discussed lately in Brussels. The establishment of stronger bonds between EU fusion cells and NATO centers of excellence working on hybrid threats could potentially serve as a launching platform for official frameworks for cooperation between NATO and EU, particularly on intelligence gathering and exchange. NATO and EU have also taken steps to strengthen cooperation on cyber threats. Indeed, cyber security is currently one of the most robust areas of cooperation between NATO and the EU. And again, the Warsaw Summit added further substance to this partnership. As a result, both organizations have been integrating cyber defense requirements and standards for their respective missions and operations, strengthening joint training activities, and cooperating on research and technology in the cyber domain. This draft report highlights that the immediate nature of cyber threats provides many incentives 
and opportunities to strengthen NATO-EU cooperation. And in terms, dear colleagues, of predicting and responding to cyber threats, in particular, I would say NATO and EU could enhance their partnership through joint operations between relevant bodies. That's including NATO computer incident responsible capabilities and computer emergency response teams and nationally based cyber and security centers. Colleagues, how do we understand the prospect for future NATO-EU counter-terrorism -terrorism cooperation? Clearly, there will be an increased attention to both organizations' ability to deliver effective counter-terrorism policies in our current security and political environment. And both organizations have an extensive history of counter-terrorism initiatives. To date, NATO's counter-terrorism efforts have taken many different forms, including military operations such as Operation Active Endeavor, Operation Sea Guardian, as well as cooperation with partners and international institutions. In parallel to EU's counterterrorism initiatives focus on the areas outside of NATO's hard power focus. And over the past years, due to increased frequencies of terrorist attacks in Europe, we're all so much aware of these days, and we all feel the pain of these terror attacks. The EU has taken more concrete steps in terms of coordinating its counterterrorism efforts in the legal and policy sphere. Although terrorist threats are a shared concern for both NATO and the EU, efforts to strengthen counterterrorism cooperation between the two organizations have often remained in the rhetorical realm. The NATO summit in Warsaw sought to change that situation. And currently, NATO and EU counterterrorism focuses on a wide range of issues, including the CBRN weapons proliferation, local defense and security capacity building, shared awareness, maritime security, and cybersecurity. And according to this draft report, opportunities to strengthen NATO EU partnership on counterterrorism efforts in some of those areas exist. For example, let me say. Close interactions between NATO uh, CBN task force and EU Center of Excellence could be supplemented with further cooperations within the framework of NATO's Defense Against Terrorism and Science for Peace and Security programs. This could contribute to further coordination and development of counterterrorism capabilities of EU agencies, for instance, Europol and Frontex. Closer interactions between NATO, Europol, Frontex, EU cyber and EU CBRN centers of excellence also provide a good opportunity to enhance intelligence sharing and improve shared situations, situation awareness. A good example of how NATO and EU could enhance cooperation in this field are NATO EU information sharing mechanism in the Mediterranean Sea. Cybersecurity is another platform where NATO and EU could intensify their cooperation. Both organizations could strengthen their partnership by developing mechanisms to coordinate monitoring and integrate data collection capabilities, thereby facilitating NATO-EU joint intelligence efforts. This draft report, colleagues, also argues that NATO-EU partnership could be strengthened by more robust efforts to coordinate NATO-EU local capacity building activities. Both organizations are particularly active in the main countries, as a lot of colleagues are aware of, where NATO and EU conduct many programs focusing on countering IEDs, demining, military development, civilian military planning, enhancing border security capabilities, and many more. In this respect, NATO and EU could do more to improve coordination by creating appropriate frameworks of cooperation on a case-by-case -case basis which would establish responsibility, identify common goals, and delegate appropriate assets. The colleagues, challenging to the development of closer NATO-EU cooperation remain. Those ob obstacles, including the United Kingdom withdrawal from the EU, 
lack of common EU defence budget and national concerns about overlapping initiatives. Further, to mention also the question of Turkey's relationship with the EU is still being debated. Turkey remains a solid, long-standing NATO ally. Let me underline that. Finding a way to reconcile Turkey's security interests with those of the EU will be delicate political feat, at least in the short to medium term. Nevertheless, NATO and the EU should keep the efforts aimed at finding innovative ways to enhance mutual partnership, indeed only through joint efforts of both organizations will allow them to effectively tackle increasingly complex security challenges. And colleagues, let me also mention, just to find up, end up with this, that uh, of course the uh, parliamentary process in our country is also very important because if we don't work together as parliamentarians in all our decision-making concerning missions, then working closely together with the EU and NATO is also not a way to go. Finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. Look forward, of course, to this discussion and, and hearing from you what you find from this last report, just for the closing remarks. And not really finally, but you know, the best director is Eden Corbyn, the one who helped with this beautiful and wonderful report and he's the one actually doing all the work. Thank you so much. Thank you, you Angeline. Um, I've got two questions on the list. First of all, Eva Kaili. She's the representative of the European Parliament. Welcome. Hi. Uh, Chair, thank you for the floor. Uh, dear members and uh, dear colleague, uh, thank you very much for presenting this report. I would like on behalf of the European Parliament's delegation to the NATO PA to warmly welcome uh, the rapporteur's draft report on EU-NATO cooperation. I appreciate that this topic features highly on the agenda of uh, the session. And also I'm particularly glad that the European Parliament's contribution to this text is the first of this kind ever to a NATO PA report and it was not only annexed to the draft but um, some of its views are taken into account by the rapporteur um, and I would also like to thank the uh, chair of NATO PA, Mr. Paolo Ali, has helped a lot for this to happen and has improved our cooperation. Um, so, Ms. Aising, thank you so much for pointing this out. In my opinion, um, the draft report is a comprehensive one, uh, well balanced and well drafted. It's discussing, uh, discussing at length all major issues and challenges uh, where the cooperation between these two organizations can take place, and I'm convinced that it can make a substantial contribution to further developing uh, our strategic partnership in a wide range of uh, areas. Uh, but please allow me to avoid repeating uh, the messages and positions of our contribution to this text uh, since, as I said, they actually form part of the annex, but instead I would like to make uh, some following uh, additional comments and raise some uh, sort questions for everybody here to maybe um, think about. Uh, so the rapporteur devotes a particular uh, sub-chapter to the benefits and shortfalls of the cooperation framework. It's extremely important and it's also including the shortcomings in the collection and sharing of information and intelligence, uh, as well as uh, deficiencies for the EU in situational awareness. Uh, I completely agree with uh, the conclusions, uh, but I think we should discuss uh, concrete suggestions on how to improve that, uh, the intelligence collection, and also the mutual exchange of information, uh, which is called as an area for future collaboration. I myself also would consider last year's joint declaration and the common set of 42 proposals a breakthrough in interinstitutional cooperation also out of the seven areas of uh, cooperation that are agreed in uh, and further developed in the common set, the draft report discusses only two, uh, the hybrid threats and cyber defense at length and uh, in direct relation to these uh, policy documents. So in view of the upcoming implementation report to be presented by the EU High Representative and the NATO Secretary General in mid-June, um, I would also like to raise the question of how we could actually um, implement um, the agreed actions and measures and the assessment of the implementation and where we can uh, speed up 
this implementation. Um, also, maybe we can clarify because uh, we understand, and he mentioned that um, uh, the, the lines between the external and internal borders of action are a bit blurred. We should clarify that. Uh, we should start talking about uh, boldly maybe, saying that we should also make sure that the Allies respect the internal borders and not changing these borders. Um, in the draft report also, I just have two more things. Um, some areas such as chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear defense receive particular attention, although they do not feature among the areas foreseen for more cooperation under the agreed set of actions. Um, I hope that the rapporteur would uh, see a need for uh, more close cooperation in these fields, but we should discuss in which extent. And in this context, I appreciate that he discussed in detail the counter-terrorism cooperation which, if I might mention, surprisingly, it was neglected by both the joint declaration and the common set of proposals. So it's extremely important that at least NATO and EU report is talking about it um, uh, to this extent. And as regards as the Berlin uh, uh, Plus arrangements, the European Parliament is of the view that, as stated in our contribution, it should be reformulated in depth with a view to adapting them to the current strategic context. Um, this could be done, among others, by enhancing tactical and operational mechanisms in scenarios where EU and NATO are present, and also enabling uh, NATO to make the use of EU's capabilities and instruments. And finally, I strongly believe that parliamentarians have an indispensable role in pursuing their interest and in representing the values of our citizens in security and defense policy. We should be stronger on that, on the European also values and respect of uh, international law, of human rights, and uh, I think we should also strongly address that. Um, um, I think uh, also we should try to respond to the question that is raised every time what we consider important for us parliamentarians. Uh, if um, in overseeing EU-NATO cooperation and providing a stimulus to this strategic partnership and how we can improve uh, our, uh, our voice and make be, um, be louder about it. I would also like um, to congratulate again the rapporteur and um, for, this, uh, for this draft report. I hope this is the first step to improve our cooperation. And I thank you for your attention and thank you, Ms. Eysink, for, uh, for this presentation. Thank you, Eva, for your remarks. Um, then, Lorenza Batista. Thank you, Chairman. At item number 38, we correctly continue to underline the cyber threat. And uh, at the same time, we report uh, uh, the expanding cost of cyber insecurity. Do you think, uh, Angelina, we have to uh, include investments of our government to uh, Im improve cyber security in 2% of GDP of uh, defense? Thank you. Thank you so much for these uh, questions. Uh, first, Mrs. Uh, Eva Kaila. Let me first say that we are really uh, deeply impressed, actually, by the um, information given by the European Parliament. And I personally think, and I think all of us, think it's very important to work closely together. There's another body we see each other that's in the Interparliamentary Conferences, the IPC. Um, there, m some of our colleagues within here, this room, uh, gathered together within RPC. Uh, lately, it was in, in Malta a few weeks ago, and the same issues are on the table. So it seems to me that uh, more and more, we really have to cooperate together as parliamentarians. And that's first thing of all. And I should incorporate, I, I fully agree with you, with European parliamentarians as well, of course, within our own mandates, because that's differently again. And that was also stressed by Mrs. Mogherini in her report last year when it concerns the European defense and uh, foreign security, global, just global um, uh, plan, actually. So the, first of all, thank you so much for that. Um, coming to your remarks and suggestions, I, I would suggest if you could just bring this uh, in, in amendments or just bring it to us, we, we can see what we can do with it because that's actually what the rapporteur was asking and you are very much reacting to that. So I think that would be worth do and we're looking to my colleagues as well because that's the best way to, to work and see how we can, uh, and as you said, the first step to improve cooperation. 
and of course we're looking forward to see more of your colleagues to take part in this discussion. That's very important, particularly also when it concerns our close missions, EU and NATO together. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that. Um, then the second question concerning uh, dear colleague Lorenzo, concerning the expanding cyber and including investment. Let me say that's, that's probably not easy because then you talk about the national and, and the international, of course, reports. As we all know, the first report from Mrs. Mukher, that was, was um, um, Madame Ashton, the first report we had, let me recall, try to recall, December 2013. Uh, 25 came out of council, the council of December 2013, and, and cyber was all part of that. At that time, colleagues, that's only three years ago, cyber was on a national level only. And now, a few years ago, we talk about cyber as an international level to discuss. And you're asking me, Lorenzo, now, if we could include that in the 2%. Um, I believe and I think we should have, we should try to find out uh, uh, more, have, we, we need more discussion if this is on a national level, of course, for a certain um, uh, way, because a lot of happening on a national level, but also internationally when we work together in mission fields and when it concerns Article 4 or 5, for instance. So we have to go deep in that, I would suggest, but it's a very good question because it makes us very much aware of the fact that cyber is part, of course, of missions. Cyber is, is, is part in all we do um, whenever it comes up to Article uh, 42, EU, Lisbon Treaty, or when it comes to Article 4 or 5. So I would suggest, Lorenzo, that we um, try to go deep into that and see what we can do with it, with more information coming into the annual session on the 7th and 8th of October coming up. Do you agree, Lorenzo, with my suggestion? You do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lorenzo. Mr. Chair, this was as far as the question so far. No. Oh. The problem is, when you're not the chair, you can't decide on this. So I, I, I got another question, and I would, would propose to allow uh, <laughs> to uh, admit this question. Um, but um, yes, it's a question of Mr. Loveras from Greece, and it I think not, that we, will be the final question. Thank you, thank you, Madam Asing. It is not a question, but some uh, 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 very short uh, remarks. First, for the paragraph uh, 10, according to our knowledge and um, information, I think that the Berlin Plus arrangement are still functioning in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Mm -hmm. Regarding the, the, the operation uh, Alfia. Informally, not, not unofficially. Yeah. Formally not. Yeah. But as arrangements are still functioning. The second regards as well uh, the paragraph 10, and I don't think that uh, uh, Cyprus question is a very good uh, and accurate example for um, mentioning in this paragraph. If it is possible, uh, you could correct this. And for the paragraph um, 14, 15, 15, sorry. The name of the E Frontex led operation is not Triton, it's Posidon. There is a need for rewriting it. And uh, as a last uh, remark, for the paragraph uh, 74, I think that uh, we have to rewrite the sentence regarding the EU deficiencies on um, defense policies. To repeat it, I said that in the paragraph 44, um, we, it is better to, 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 to uh, rewrite the sentence regarding the EU deficiencies, regarding the um, uh, defense policies. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks. We will look into that. And of course, we understand the situation from Greece towards Cyprus. Just let's give it a name because that's where the discussion is all about, and that was my introduction as well. So we should go look into that, and we should just name it and see what we can do with it, because uh, we have to work with it, as Lorenzo said, on a, on a national level. And it is not the level. unique example. I know, I know, I know but if, 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 if you don't mind, I don't 
I think it's good to just to name and to discuss it together. I very much appreciate that you just brought it up. Thank you very much. And all the other remarks, text suggestions are written down, so maybe you can afterwards communicate with the director. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Angeline, for taking over once again. No, no. And also this report will be presented in a final version in Bucharest. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the next uh, point uh, on our agenda is a summary of the future activities of the Subcommittee on Future Security and Defense Capabilities. Uh, and it will be presented by Gilbert Lebris. He's aware of that? Yes. Okay. You can do it from your you, you can do it from your chair. And she'll be replacing the chairman Xavier Penta. Oui, 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 tout à qui fait. a aussi un engagement exact. à l'élection. Ils sont tous en élection en ce moment. <laughs> Euh, merci, euh, Monsieur le Président. La sous-commission euh, sur l'avenir de la sécurité et des capacités de défense a un plan d'activité très intéressant pour 2017, pour ceux qui y en seront. La première visite de la sous-commission sera consacrée à la Corée du Sud en septembre prochain. Comme vous le savez bien, les tensions sur la péninsule coréenne se sont intensifiées ces derniers mois, suscitant de plus en plus de préoccupations pour la paix et la sécurité internationale dans la région et au-delà. En Corée, la délégation explorera l'évolution de la dynamique de la sécurité en Asie et de l'Est et la perspective de la République de Corée concernant les menaces à court et à long terme, telles que la prolifération des missiles balistiques dans la péninsule coréenne, les perspectives de négociations renouvelées entre Séoul et Pyongyang, et les relations coréennes avec les États-Unis, le Japon et la Chine et la Russie. La délégation explorera également de nouvelles voies pour la coopération en matière de sécurité entre la République de Corée et les alliés de l'OTAN. Je suis certain que beaucoup d'entre vous seront intéressés par ce, pour se joindre à cette délégation. Notre directeur de commission, Ethan Corbin, transmettra toutes les informations pertinentes à la visite dès qu'il le pourra. La deuxième visite de la Commission aura lieu au Maroc, fin octobre ou début novembre. Au Maroc, la délégation de la DSCTC sera rejointe par la sous-commission de la Commission politique sur les partenariats de l'OTAN. Au Maroc, notre délégation explorera les sujets, les sujets suivants. Sécurité en Afrique du Nord et du Sud de la Méditerranée. Politique marocaine et action en matière de lutte contre le terrorisme. Coopération entre les pays d'Afrique du Nord et coopération marocaine avec les partenaires européens et les organisations internationales. Je suis également certain que beaucoup d'entre vous seront très intéressés par cette visite. Comme il s'agit d'une visite conjointe, je vous recommande vivement de vous inscrire dès que notre directeur de commission enverra les informations nécessaires. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci, Gilbert. Um, next, Lord Campbell. He will, as a chairman of the subcommittee, he will present the future activities of the subcommittee on transatlantic defence and security. Uh, chairman, I feel a great sense of responsibility since I'm all that stands between you and gin and tonic. Uh. Well, <laughs> I don't know exactly what your rhythm is, um, but maybe we can extend this with a few minutes. So. Uh, I'll Go ahead, my, and I'll I have some other best. businesses. I, I ask, um, I, I think, ten will, minutes of your patience now. So, <laughs> As colleagues will know, the theme for this year's visit has been the challenges and opportunities in the high north and south. And a delegation went to Kirkness in Norway. Uh, that is the border, on the border, of course, with Russia, immediately following the joint special seminar in Svalbard, which many people also intended, uh, attended. I myself was unable to attend the visit in Kirkness, but the delegation was ably led by my predecessor as chairman of this subcommittee, Sver Miril, to whom I extend my thanks. The visit 
was according to those who went informative. It gleaned a comprehensive overview of the benefits and challenges, uh, security, political, scientific, and civil cooperation, which necessarily present themselves in relation to Russia with a 196 kilometer border, which Norway shares with that country in the high north. And I understand a mission report will be made available shortly on the NATO PA website uh, by our much valued director. The second visit of the subcommittee will be to Italy in November. The subcommittee will join the Mediterranean Special Group Seminar in Rome from the 23rd to the 24th of November, and then will continue on a day visit to Naples to be briefed on NATO's new hub for the South, which of course is yet another post-war, a post-Warsaw uh, alliance initiative to deal with the com complex security challenges, many of which we've discussed today, which emanate from across the Mediterranean into the Middle East, North Africa and beyond. I'm told that notification for registration and participation will be sent as soon as it is available, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Main Campbell. Um, I fully agree with your assessment of the Norway travel because it was excellent, and uh, all the ones who participated in it were very positive on this uh, on this trip. Are there any questions to uh, Lord Campbell and um, Gilbert Lebris about the upcoming activities? No. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, before uh, going to the next point on the agenda, any other business, looks a little bit like miscellaneous and all other things, um, uh, nothing less than that I would say because I want to say some words to Gilbert and Angeline because they are leaving uh, us, they are leaving our committee. And um, I can say on behalf of all members of the committee that they are very high appreciated members of this committee always uh, very active, both of them. Uh, maybe uh, it's because they belong to the same political group, I don't know. But I can only say positive words about you. First of all, Gilbert, you entered uh, NATO PA in 2002. And in 2012, you became head of the French delegation and um, you held several leadership roles, mainly in our committee, but also as a chairman of the GSM group. And. Um, I can only say from my personal experience that you are a very kind colleague, always very firm in your statements, a good ambassador of both France and NATO and the Alliance. And um, you decided to not stand up again for re-election in your national parliament. And that means, unfortunately, unhappily, that you have to leave the assembly. And um, well, well, that's a pity for, for all of us and um, um, I hope you will do well afterwards, uh, of course, in good health, in good shape, but also you can do some other things which you could, couldn't do in the recent years when you were a member of parliament. Merci beaucoup, Gilbert, pour, uh, oh, oh, um, um, well, for all your efforts. I tried in French, but I failed lately, sorry. Um, then Angeline. Uh, Angeline, she uh, entered the NATO PA in 2007 and she also held several positions within this committee and lately she was the vice president of our PA. Uh, she took uh, up the initiative to engage more women in the armed forces within the NATO PA and the basis for that was UN resolution 1325, one of the only resolutions I know from, from, um, uh, from number. And it, it is also about the discussion of women in armed forces. And you were, with some colleagues, one of the initiators within the assembly to uh, organize several meetings about this, uh, this issue. And, um, well, I know you, of course, from the Dutch parliament, where we were colleagues. Um, but also, uh, what I said to Gilbert, I can say to you, you were very committed, you were very active, very engaged, a real member of the alliance, and we will both miss you very much and we wish you all the best in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs> Colleagues, we are nearing the end of our meeting and my question to you is, is there any other business we have to talk about which was not on the agenda? No. Then uh, I want to express on the 
behalf of the entire committee, um, my gratitude to all the guest speakers and to the staff of the Georgian delegation who have worked very hard to make this session a success and indeed a very memorable moment. I would also like to thank the, uh, our Secretariat staff for all our considerable efforts today, also throughout the year. You've heard it about the reports. Of course, our director, Ethan Corbin, uh, but also our coordinator for today, Anna Pichlow, who is replacing Jay Lee because she is uh, expecting uh, her baby soon. So she couldn't hear today. But Anna, you did a great job to replace uh, Jay Lee. And we should also thank our research assistants and official note takers, Carmen Chapman and Marcia Lemke, for their efforts as well. And I would also like to thank our interpreters. They are in the back of our room and they have performed exceptionally, as always. Thank you very much. Without your presence, this meeting would be a little bit different and less effective. Um, and finally, I would like to thank all of you who participated in this meeting today. Um, not only for your participation today, but also your participation during the year, during our visits and during the preparation of uh, reports. I look forward to seeing you at um, the annual session in Bucharest in October, which takes place from 6th to 9th of October, and hope to see you in good shape and good health over there. And thereby, I close this session. <laughs>